This week on the Nonprofit News Feed, we have a little story about telemarketing scams costing nonprofits millions, sad news from Metropolitan Opera, and some updates from Maui. Nick, how's it going? It's going great, George. So I'll start us off today with our top story, and that is a telemarketing scheme indictments bring to the surface on the forefront warnings on safe donation practices. So on Thursday, prosecutors in New York arrested Richard Zeitlin and Robert Piaro for allegedly defrauding donors of tens of millions of dollars that were meant for political nonprofit groups supporting causes like aid to military veterans and breast cancer research, according to reporting from the New York Times. So Zeitlin ran telemarketing call centers, is charged with fraud, obstruction of justice, and conspiracy. And Piaro, who served as a treasurer for several political nonprofit groups, is charged with wire fraud and mail fraud. Both individuals could face significant prison sentences if convicted. So the indictment says that Zeitlin instructed employees at his call centers to intentionally mislead donors. It also says that Piaro made fraudulent claims about how donations would be spent. Apparently, 22 million of the 20 million raised went to companies providing telemarketing services. And Piaro himself paid himself, rather, nearly half a million dollars from the money raised. So essentially, investigators found that these two individuals kept a significant portion of the money they raised was sent to companies or spent on fundraising vendors with ties to these individuals. Um, and this story kind of underscores the necessity for transparency, accountability, and vigilance in nonprofit fundraising. Uh, George, we here at Whole Whale, the publishers of the this newsletter and podcast, um, have a guide for nonprofit professionals willing interested in communicating accountability and transparency when it comes to donation management. But George, we have some kind of bad actors here that were taken to task by prosecutors, but this is the second type story and distinct story that we've done on this, where you have these telemarketing and other fundraising professionals who create, basically create self-feedback loops, they're self-enrichment schemes, right? Um, the other one, the illegality was a little bit more gray. It seems like it's a little bit more clear here because they expressly lied about where the money was going. But what should nonprofit professionals take away from this when it comes to communicating trust? And what should donors and the general public take away from this when it comes to ensuring that their donations are going to the causes they want? So I think it's important to note that of the four groups listed in Mr. Piero's indictment included, not limited to, Standing by Veterans PAC, Americans for the Cure of Breast Cancer PAC, uh, Association for Emergency Responders and Firefighters, and U.S. Veterans Assistance Foundation. Clearly, they are named in confident ways, designed to build trust by association with things that sound like they've been established for a long time so that when you're calling, you can sort of match that organization with somebody's key interests. I think this is um, something I I like to kind of push a little bit on because there is a movie coming out called Uncharitable, and we should probably cover it in the coming days, but it's around the overhead myth and Dan Plata and his famous TED Talk talks about it saying, hey, you know, you know, we were shut down because we had a little too much overhead, but we raised millions of dollars. And so the question is, how much is too much for overhead? There's a number, right? There's a fraudulent number. And uh, here's here's the other way of framing this. They raised something like twenty eight million dollars for this variety of nonprofits, but it cost them twenty two million dollars. So in one extreme ar argument with the damn Plata, where it's like overhead is justified 100% of the time, hey, $6 million made it to some of these organizations via grants that maybe wouldn't have otherwise. The other way of looking at it is saying that actually there is money that would have been donated otherwise because – it is there is a finite amount donated every year toward different causes. And so when someone writes that check for one, that sort of fulfills their amount given. And on average, we're talking about 2% of GDP and people have giving thresholds. And once it's hit that, they don't give to other 
more efficiently run, more established organizations that aren't spending on fundraising. So I think it's important to note that there's a legal line. It's not just, oh, it feels good sometimes or it should be allowed no matter what for overhead. But like there is overhead that is unacceptable. And that's when the government steps in and arrests you or indicts you. Like, yeah, there's a line. And I think it's important for organizations to, again, come around and pay attention to, because you can report organizations that look suspicious in your name domain. If you're like, wait a minute, it looks like this organization has tremendous overhead, has a reputable name, but no real operational staff, maybe. This is appropriate research to do, especially if you're an organization operating in any of these fields. You heard I was mentioning veterans, I'm mentioning cancer, I'm mentioning first responders and disaster relief. If you see these types of things going on, you can report them, you can call them out. And I, I think, you know, we need a, probably a few more eyes because as you mentioned, this is the second story we're talking about where this happens. I'm also curious if there's anyone in their mind being like, that's totally fine. They raised $6 million for good causes that wouldn't have otherwise been raised. I would disagree with you, but so would the US government. Yeah, George, I think that's an that's kind of a little bit of, of an interesting question. But to be clear here, there were like legitimate felonies committed here <laughs> beyond <laughs> just like the overhead question, right? Like there was like wire fraud, there was like mm -hmm. illegal transfers, like all of that stuff, right? So there were actual crimes like committed. Thank you. Yeah. With regards with regards to that kind of question, right? I think you bring up a great point, which is the point of charities is not to raise money. They are to raise money in service of a thing right? The money and the fundraising is not the ends. It is the means to the end, right? So creating this, like, oh my gosh, we raised $28 million. But yeah, at what cost, as you say, and it could have gone to something much more efficient. And it's interesting you brought up um, Uncharitable, that movie. I think it'd be great to do some kind of a, a movie night, uh, some kind of community type event around this movie, because it brings up really interesting questions. Because I think that oftentimes, charities and nonprofits do get kind of pigeonholed into having to be like, as efficient as humanly possible. And fundraising can be really important. That being said, here, it's fraudulent. So I think there's, we're going into fundraising season, George, we're in the summer lull. By the way, if you're listening to this, the time to start planning for end of year fundraising is now. Don't wait until it's too late. Giving Tuesday is just around the corner. And as marketers, we have to tell that to people. But I think there's a lot of conversation to be had from this. And in the meantime, be safe. Um, we have resources that we can drop in the show notes that include our own resources here at Whole about how we tell organi organizations to communicate transparency, right? So annual reports, things like Charity Navigator and, and, you know, if your accountability ratings, et cetera, like communicating trust, transparency and financial accountability to audiences is important, right? Do you have your Form 990 easily accessible on your website? All of those are things that you can do to instill trust in donors. Um, and that's going to become ever more important as we move. Yes, into, you know, there's always been charitable fraud like this, but as we talked about a couple of months ago, AI based fraud and donors are going to come more susceptible. And George, as you say, those cause verticals, veterans, police, buyer, cancer. I think there's a, there's a demographic who might be more susceptible to giving money to via cold calls over the phone. And quite frankly, that's older folks who are overwhelmingly susceptible to, to fraud of, of this type. So I think that those are all really important things for nonprofit professionals to keep in mind heading into fundraising yeah. season. And to be clear, thank you for calling me out on like, it wasn't the fact that 85% went to overhead. It was the indictments associated with false claims about where and how the money would be spent and misrepresenting and leading donors to believe one thing versus another. And that's something regardless of your overhead. You can't mislead a donor in terms of where their funds go. That, I mean, legally is a problem. And you're right. That's what, that's what got it. It's not the like necessarily that amount of <laughs> overhead and the processing. 
Uh, so thanks for, for calling that out. Another resource to look at is causeiq.com. Causeiq.com, uh, they, they have been a past uh, client of ours, but I think has one of the best data resources for nonprofit data, looking at deep analysis on an organization's spend over years and trends. It's, it, it's really potent. So if you are doing that sort of research on like, hey, how legit is this? organization that seems to have a similar name in our space and you know our, our donors are getting calls from them and are hearing about them i would probably that would probably be my first stop yeah that's a great call out fantastic resources there for nonprofit professionals interested in learning about other organizations in your cause space and george as you say you'll notice those names are general vague but also official sounding enough um, that they kind of piggyback off of the reputation of actual legitimate substantial nonprofits. So something to be careful about and just everyone, we all have to be vigilant, right? So stay tuned for more on cybersecurity and avoiding fraudulent schemes at the Nonprofit Newsfeed Podcast. George, I'm going to take us into the summary. And our first story here is that the Metropolitan Opera Guild will wind down amid financial woes. The story itself is kind of it's a little bit of a small one. It's a contained one. Um, but we we wanted to highlight it because a trend that we're seeing, I think, is that arts institutions broadly, even ones associated with organizations as storied, right, as the Metropolitan Opera, have been struggling since the pandemic and potentially, and even since then. We talked about the public theater in New York, which originated the show Hamilton, also experiencing financial woes and cutting off staff just a couple ago. So the Metropolitan Opera Guild, they ran an opera magazine, um, they did other activities as, as the Guild, and it seems that some responsibilities will be taken over by the Met Opera. But the bottom line is that, quite frankly, arts as a whole is struggling um, to rebound from the pandemic. So I think something to keep an eye on this sector of the nonprofit world. Yeah, I think the, the New York City is the bellwether for how you know, arts, arts adjacent organizations are faring and nonprofits in particular still are having that lag COVID effect. And so I imagine if it's happening in New York, it's also happening regionally as well. So tough time for arts organizations, it seems. That it is. And speaking of arts, you want to talk about music. This one comes from a kind of a, a curious source, the violin channel. Um, <laughs> Ever storied news. Uh, I was so happy when I found violin. this one. I was like, yeah, violin channel. Amazing. George, you play something, don't you? Uh, I play the cello, yes. Amazing. All right. We have the string section represented here. But the story is that record labels have sued the nonprofit Internet Archive for copyright infringement. So um, if you've ever gone on a deep dive, you wanted to see a website before it was updated or view since deleted Twitter posts, whatever have you, you probably have stumbled across the Internet Archive, which takes digital kind of screenshots, if you will, of more or less the entire Internet, um, or at least the commonly accessed websites um, on the Internet and stores them on a database, an interactive database that one can interact with, um, including media and apparently including records. So this article says that over 2000 records, copyright records from the 1970s, um, actually appear on the internet archive, and they're being sued by some of those media companies for copyright infringement. So this brings up some interesting questions versus free and open internet and archiving versus copyright infringement and might be kind of an existential problem for the internet archive, which while it hosts all this stuff is something of a valuable resource for kind of internet, internet infrastructure and internet research. I'm curious your take on this, George. It's I have such a soft spot for archive.org and the important work of like saving and making snapshots of websites. I 
I find myself using it quite a bit to understand the history of different organizations and the, as they progress. And this particular one seems to be a battle over the Great 78 Project, which was trying to preserve and create access to music that were on 78 RPM records. They equate it to an illegal record store. I'm actually hoping that they realize that this is really an archival action and less of one trying to generate revenue from it as opposed to like, saving information. I think it would be a whole different story if it wasn't a nonprofit and it was like a for-profit just like selling ads against it. But again, it's one of those things that the, the 501c3 does give you that umbrella for. And, you know, I genuinely see the, the value of having this current weird history of the internet as it evolves. Like if you want a, a fun time, like go back to like what Google looked like in 2000 or like any nonprofit site, I think there's there's value there. Now, I think there is something to be said for how things are being used, and there are technical ways of putting limits on it. So if people are suddenly using archive.org to go back and like stream artists who start, like certainly have license to their music and use it as like a player platform, like that's a problem. But for the purposes of archival, it's, you know, it's simply a medium in the same way that a museum or a library is. It just happens to be digital. So some some nuance there, but I'm I'm on the I'm on the .org side, probably. George, I think I'm actually inclined to agree with you. I was talking with a friend recently, and he went to a, a conference with some speaker. And, you know, one of those, like, techno-utopia type conferences. But the speaker brought up an interesting question, which I think doesn't get talked enough about. And that is that the transience of, transience of information in our current era is really, really flimsy. And kind of perilous, right? So much information, photos, archives are just slowly lost, right? Because they don't exist physically, right? They just kind of disappear, they evaporate. You forget your Google Photos password. All of a sudden, you have 10 years of photos that just no longer exist. And I think that the Internet Archive is part of an internet infrastructure that's actually going to be really important, not just for kind of nerds like you and I, but for society as a whole, as understanding society and people's 20, 30, 40, 50 years in the future, when all of this stuff has disappeared. So I am very pro archive. I think there's a lot to gain from it and a lot to lose by neglecting it. All right, I will take us into our next one. And this one comes from The Nonprofit Times. And it's a follow up on one that we put in our newsletter last week, but we wanted to talk about it on the podcast. And that is that uh, the title of this article is Some Charities Lost It All on Maui, but are still working. So a couple of weeks ago, there were devastating fires on the island of Maui in Hawaii. And we highlighted in our newsletter last week a amazing organization, the Pacific Whale Foundation, that had pivoted to providing emergency relief for employees and other folks in the community in desperate need. Here we have the Nonprofit Times talking about the Salvation Army, which lost its Lahaina Lighthouse core complex, and it had a church, a thrift shop, residential quarters for its staff. There's essentially an entire town that needs rebuilding, lots of lives lost. This is one of the deadliest wildfires in U.S. history. The estimated death toll is at 106, and officials expect it to rise. There's a ton of need in Maui. So we wanted to highlight in this article from the Nonprofit Times organizations that are pivoting and helping others while they themselves are in precarious situations. So, of course, the one highlighted in this article, um, and we also, in our newsletter, link to a CNN article that talks um, about kind of the human toll of the fires. There's so much talk about rebuilding and what went wrong, but at the bottom, it's a, it's a human tragedy, tons of lives impacted, tons of lives lost in a really devastating and tragic way. Um, so uh, just want to kind of you know, George, we talk about disasters and conflicts and earthquakes and hurricanes. And we talk about how the, the attention um, to these disasters is, is so time bound. They're so time restricted. Right. Um, and I think if we can do one thing here, um, it's just to continue to keep uh, the need of these communities um, in the thoughts of our listeners as that need um, is only going to grow. Um, as rebuilding gets underway and people try to put their lives back together. 
Yeah. Uh, another one also for any organizations doing environmental work, such as Pacific whale.org. I mean, they lost in Lahaina their, their vessels and, you know, 22 of their staff have no homes right now to return to. So, you know, it's not just, you know, the immediate need, but it's also the, the surrounding nonprofit ecosystem that helps, um, in terms of important work for the environment and others, uh, has, has been impacted as well. Absolutely. Um, we'll continue to, to talk about um, Maui and Hawaii, but George, I think it's about time for a feel good story. Um, and I have a good one for you. This one comes from WDRB in Louisville, Kentucky, and it talks about a gala focused on powering girls' self confidence um, that was held by a nonprofit. So the ACE Project held its first ever prom gala at the runway on Cane Run Road. PROM is an acronym for positive reinforcement over myself, um, and it's designed to help uh, build uh, sewing and design skills um, in young women while empowering them. Um, and it culminates in this fashion show that seems uh, to be a ton of fun. Um, and I think that youth programs like this can be so potent because they both build those skills, um, are fun to do, um, but also give you tangible kind of life lessons along the way. So I uh, just wanted to shout out um, the awesome people um, at the ACE Project um, and the folks who run the prom gala. Oh, that's a great story. Um, as we move into our joke, uh, I do want to give a shout out to Cause Writer AI, one of Whole Whale's tools. CauseWriter.ai allows basically an organization to get custom built based on their data, their brand, a bunch of different chat endpoints that will help them create content like newsletters, grant proposals, social posts, blog posts, resources, and a lot more. There are also several different AI image generators rolled into a quick interface so that you can have some fun creating imagery to feed the social monsters that require it. So that is causewriter.ai. And now onto the joke. Uh, hey, Nick, <laughs> what, hey, level, <laughs> what level of donation takes real guts to make? Oh, gosh. What level? Uh, organ donation. Oh, I see. I see. I see that one. I see ya. Uh, pretty good, right? Organ donation. As a reminder, uh, please register, be uh, become an organ donor. Um, our friends at registerme.org can help you do that. Uh, it takes guts to be a real donor. How about that tagline? It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> All right. That's what you get for making it to the end. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, George. <laughs>